the, the, the way I've done the presentation is to look at a lot of different items that are available in the National Library of Scotland in the John Murray archive, where there's um, an, uh, a collection of Isabella's letters and works. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, I started with a letter because I think it's quite an interesting letter. It's a letter that Isabella wrote in 1897 from Singapore, where she's about to embark on her trip to the Malay Peninsula. She's just left Japan, and I think you can see the word splendid written uh, under there in the slide. And um, she's very taken by the tropical, the tropical landscape that she's about to explore. And um, there is an extract from the letter, which I think is quite interesting. It says, how singular people all seem to me now who live in our dim, dull island and wear our hideous clothes. <laughs> so she's developing some opinions, but it wasn't always like that. Isabella was born in October 1831 to the Reverend Edward Burt and his second wife, Dora at her mother's family home in Boroughbridge Hall in Yorkshire. The families were both of upper middle class background and both of them were very religious. Edward Bird was related to William Wilberforce, whose anti-slavery philosophies were very influential in the family and I think influenced Bird for most of her life. Uh, philanthropy was a major part of, the, of her upbringing. The second picture there shows um, Taplow Hill in Tatton Hall, where her grandfather stayed. Edward Bird was, um, he moved from parish to parish, often because of conflicts with congregation over working in the Sabbath, from which, for which he had uh, very strong views. But uh, Henrietta was born at Tatton Hall in 1834, Isabella's sister, that's her there. And um, she became a really major figure in Isabella's life. And um, she was a recipient of her travel letters, which were later published. We had an idyllic upbringing um, in Grandfather Bird's house, but um, ill health began to be a problem and continued to be a problem all her life for Isabella. She had spinal problems and at the age of 18, she went through an operation on her spine, which helped, but uh, health problems persisted all of her life. Her father was a big influence and taught her to observe people, animals and nature, as well as how to ride well. And the girls were both tutored at home in classics and literature by their mother, Dora. When Isabella was 11, unfortunately, her grandfather died and that was the end of their days at Taplow Hill when they then had to move to St Thomas uh, to Birmingham for um, her father to take up a post at St Thomas's church. It was a bit of a change for them from their country lifestyle. Edward Bird continued his strict views and the congregation dwindled again in St Thomas's and in 1848 the family moved to Huntington Dunshire for him to take up another post. Isabella's health continued to be an issue even here in this lovely spot and partly because of this and the strict observation of Sabbath in Scotland, the family spent several summers in the west of Scotland and the Highlands and Islands visiting Rosshire, Skye, Rassie, Mull and Iona, among other places. I put in a photograph here of, um, of all the lovely places I could choose. I chose Calgary Bay on the Isle of Mull, um, particularly for this presentation, and also because it's one of my favourite spots that she would have visited. These visits probably gave her her love of wild, remote, mountainous regions and uh, promoted a desire to travel as well as improve her well-being. But Isabella's health began to deteriorate further and a Scottish doctor prescribed travel. Isabel, um, sorry, Edward Bird financed her first visit to North America, giving her £100 to stay away as long as it lasted, i.e. the £100. So she travelled north 
America and Canada, staying with unnamed relatives and enjoy adventures with anonymous uh, with anonymous cousins. She doesn't give their names, who they are. But it was her first long voyage abroad. She was 23 years old at the time, and I think it was instrumental in developing her writing career. This next picture that you see beside Calgary Bay is um, a letter which was written by one uh, John Milford, who was a travel writer who met Isabella after she returned from America. And he was the person who wrote this letter of introduction to John Murray, the well-known publisher of travelogues and literature. Very huge amount of work published by him. And really, this began the long-term relationship of um, Isabella Bird and the John Murray publishing enterprise, which lasted, it lasted all of Bird's life. The last photo shows a very early edition of the English Women in America, which is held in the Murray Archive. Bird travelled thousands of miles and wrote very lively, chatty accounts of frontier towns, Fashionable ladies, hardworking gentlemen, gold diggers, conductors, prairie pioneers, met First Nations um, people, and really has a very lively account of her, her trip there. But uh, she does say that she has a fascination for American wealth and the promise of the future. But like her father, she was uh, very critical of the attitude towards the Sabbath, which I think is quite interesting. So this is the period now where she begins to emerge as a writer and a traveller. She returns to America um, after a, a further health struggles. There's not so much written about this time, but we do know that she went there to study religion in America. And she, there's this photo here is um, part of her, her, um, uh, of her book where she's very critical of Christians who owned enslaved people and were involved with plantations. Um, it was a publication commissioned by the Religious Tract Society who also published the leisure hour. There's a little pamphlet of the uh, photo of the leisure hour at the end of the line there. So she was writing for um, various magazines at this time. Unfortunately, Edward Hale's Edward Bird's health deteriorated and he died in 1858, not long after Isabella returned from America. The family then had to move out of the rectory to Edinburgh and Isabella became depressed at this time, stating to Murray that her father was the mainspring and object of her life. John Murray, this um, portrait that you see here is of John Murray III, who was the one who was most influential to Isabella. He encouraged a trip to Ireland at the time as a first step for her to get back into travel, but also to find out more about the political issues which were taking place there. And that was uh, later published. The next slide shows just the title page from the Aspects of Religion in the United States of America, and it was published in the same year. The photo that you see of the rather grand tenement corner building there is Castle Terrace where Isabella stayed, but she thought it was a bit of a grim place. Although she did not stay in the corner piece there, she stayed around the corner and she had magnificent views of Edinburgh Castle from, from her window. In 1861, there begins another period. She begins to um, develop some causes at this time, and she undertakes trips to Inner and Outer Hebrides here. The picture you see at the bottom left-hand corner there is a recent picture of the Isle of Harris. And um, that she enters what, what's maybe a quite controversial period here, where she supports Lady Cuthbert Gordon, in her assisted immigration scheme. I'd be interested to know if anybody uh, listening would knows any more about this because she supported Highland immigrants using their family connections in Canada and uh, many were tra transported to Saskatchewan. But the outcome of this isn't known. There's, she does make another trip back there to, to see the progress made, but we don't really hear what, what has happened after that. But during this time, her mother, Dora Bird, who you see there in the bonnet, 
He died in 1866 and Isabella kind of threw herself in then to another cause where she started looking at the poverty in the Edinburgh slums. She gives a really, really scathing um, account of the living conditions there and I have to say the people that are living there, which to me is a bit of a forerunner for a lot of the writing that she does later on in her career when she visits um, more remote places. Um, the engraving, the next picture is an engraving above a close in the Royal Mile in Edinburgh and it comes from a pamphlet which was published by Murray on um, the notes on the old Edinburgh slums. These areas were just just down the road from where Isabella was living, which I think was what was so shocking to her. Um, after the same, Henrietta leased her cottage in Tobermory, but she and Isabella stayed in the city in the winter time. But ill health began again to trouble Isabella, and she then travelled to Australia and New Zealand which she doesn't say much about. She wasn't that impressed by either of these places, but she was even less impressed, I think, by the paddle steamer that she travelled back on, which is this ship here, the Nevada. I think it was on its final cruise, and she talks quite a bit about how awful that journey was. This drawing is from um, is from New Zealand um, Gallery, the, the National Gallery of New Zealand, and it's by William Matthew Hodgson, who was quite an eminent... Um, artist of the time, but the real the real issue here not not the real issue the real important event here was that she left the steamer which was headed for San Francisco, but she left it at Honolulu, and you'll see this beautiful engraving um, of um, a Hawaiian landscape here because this is what really began her journey and her writing career when she stopped off at Honolulu, and ended up staying there for uh, six months. This is where she really began her letter writing form and her letters to uh, Henrietta, which became her trademark really for her travelogues. Um, she followed that. Isabel, uh, Henrietta was on the point of joining her in uh, Hawaii, but Isabella left uh, quite swiftly then and uh, headed out to the Rockies. And it was this trip to the Rockies that really cemented her career as a travel writer. She um, was famous here for climbing Long's Peak, one of the first women to do so. She lived in a cabin on her own at Estes Park and um, perhaps became it became most famous for meeting the mountain Jim, who was the desperado that she fell in love with. But um, she knew, she wrote to Henrietta, that she could never marry. Such a man. So again, this is where her writing really, really takes off. The engraving here at the beginning shows um, is from the Sandwich Islands and it shows the ladies' Hawaiian riding dress, which um, she explains quite a bit in addition to of a lady's life in the Rockies. After a severe criticism of her dress and riding style, she rode a horse, um, as they rode astride the horse rather than side saddle. And she came under severe criticism in the Times following the first edition of A Lady's Life in the Rocky Mountains. Um, her letters were read out in small ladies' literary circles in Edinburgh and on Ireland by Henrietta and her friends. And Henrietta was um, assisted in a lot of the in the editing of her books. Her next trip was to Japan, which was suggested by John Murray, and she was assisted there by Sir Harry Parks, the British Minister in Japan. Um, this is a front space from Unbeaten Tracks in Japan, which arguably was the most famous and successful of all her books. It was re reprinted many times. Um, a real highlight of this book and these travels for me was her relationship with her servant interpreter, Ito Churi's I find that difficult to pronounce. And she never uses his name, his, his surname in, in the book, but um, he's a very, very interesting character. And uh, she couldn't have made the trip without his language skill because it was the first time she'd travelled anywhere where English wasn't widely spoken. 
but includes a fascinating study of modern Meiji Japan, traditional Japanese culture, and the indi indigenous Ainu people. And it led to Isabella having a lifelong attachment to the Far East, although she moans a lot about Japan <laughs> when she's in there. She left Japan and went to the Malay Straits on very short notice uh, on the recommendation of Parks, and he arranged for British officials in Malaya to support her journeys there. So the next picture is the front piece from the Golden Chersonese and the Wee Thither, showing her riding an elephant to the British residency, residency in Parak. Um, I would argue that this is possibly her most colonial work, as she and she frequently compares this with Africa, saying it must be like Africa several times in her letters to Henrietta. But her most famous letter here is um, her great Parak letter, which was 116 pages long. And I don't, you probably can't see it from the slides, but her writing is tiny and she uses small pieces of paper. So good for Henrietta to get through those 116 pages. And she tests all sorts of wildlife and um, natural landscapes there. And um, she's, this is where she's really becoming part of probably a kind of imperial travel writing group and um, is certainly becoming one of the most established female writers of the Victorian age. The last picture is from the first edition Ordnance Survey map of this area when she visits uh, Mount Sinai and Mount Catherine on her way home. But she becomes very sick on this journey and um, she returns to Mung to re recover. Um, I hope I'm okay for time, David. Are we yeah, you're doing fine. Doing okay there. Um, her next period, unfortunately, is um, a, a mixed period for her when she sees success, but also personal tragedy. Her most famous books uh, in the personal letter style are being published, and um, she is becoming very successful. But unfortunately, at the same time, Henrietta died. She died, the, as I said here, The Lady's Life in the Documentaries was published in 1879. This is a picture from the title page where she is wearing that uh, infamous riding habit. But uh, Henrietta, Henrietta died in 1880 and her death had a huge impact on Isabella. She died of typhoid at the age of only 44 and um, she was nursed by a family friend, an admirer of Isabella. Dr. John Bird, who trained with Dr. Joseph Lister in Edinburgh. The photo here shows the cottage in Tobermory, which actually is still there and remains quite similar to this photo, which was taken during the, like, her lifetime. She writes a, a very moving letter to John Murray at the time, explaining her, her grief. And uh, she says of Henrietta, she was everything to me, whether present or absent. It is too soon, and I am too dazed with grief and fatigue to think of any future. Which is quite telling, because it, it does mark the, uh, a, a gap in her travelling career. The first edition of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan was published to favourable criticism in uh, 1880, and new editions quickly followed but Isabel didn't even open the book packages when they arrived, as she had little interest now that Henny was gone. She travelled to Switzerland to recover with friends, but did not travel to the East or the West alone for another nine years. As a last promise to Henrietta, she finally agreed to marry John Bishop, who um, had proposed to her previously on several occasions but she got married in black, wearing only one stone on a golden chain, which had been gifted to her by Mrs. John Murray. And uh, that last photo you see there underneath Mount PG is uh, probably quite a well-known photograph of her, but it was taken um, and when she was wearing her wedding attire. Quite sad. So then I think she reaches a, a bit, there's a bit of a crossroads in her life at this time. As we said, she's been achieving great success uh, as an author and new editions of her books are being published. 
It's quite lovely to go to the National Library and see these early edition books and um, see how she was re how, how they were represented in the time period. So the first one shows an early edition of the Golden uh, Chassonese and the Way Thither. And uh, the next one is uh, Unbeaten Tracks in Japan. They're both John Murray public publications. Showing quite decorative hardback covers, I think, and with the, you can't actually see it in the picture, but she does have the crescent moon and the stars in the first one representing the Malayan flag and emblems and the bamboo and the full moon for Japan, possibly a reference to the growing interest in Oriental art and culture in the, the in Britain at this time. Um, her books were a success throughout the English-speaking world and uh, were published by other publishers, including P Putman in, in New York. Um, but meantime, John Bishop, though 10 years younger than Isabella, becomes ill. And though she nurses him and cares for him in the south of England and then in France, he dies in <coughs> Isabella arranges for his body to be brought back to Edinburgh, where he is buried in Dean Cemetery, along with her parents and Henrietta. Isabella inherits his wealth and, following his wishes, begins to look at setting up hospitals in Asia, which is a bit of a spark for her taking on a new set of travels. She begins to think about medical missionary work and about memorials to her husband and to Henrietta, and uh, visits to St Mary's Teaching Hospital, which you see here in Paddington, London, uh, to get some information and inspiration for hospital projects and medical missionary work. So she begins to take quite an interest in medical in missionary work at this time. She. Does, in 1887, she begins a series of lecture tours. This picture of her is actually a bit earlier than that. It's in 1880. And um, it's believed that this was taken just um, around the time of her engagement to John Bishop. But, uh, so she begins to give a, a, a series of lectures on travel, but she becomes more and more focused on missionary work. As a result, she starts training at St Mary's in London. She takes part in a short nursing course, which has not long been established there as um, a means of raising standards of nursing, not just at home, but also throughout, I, we could say the world, but probably throughout the, the empire. John Murray encourages Isabella to travel again, and he publishes her trip to Ireland um, in his newly established Murray magazine. So she takes this up and resolves to travel to Kashmir and Lesser Tibet to find a suitable location for a memorial hospital for both John Bishop and Henrietta, according to her husband's wishes. This last slide, uh, slide shows uh, a wonderful engraving from Among the Tibetans, and is entitled Starting in Srinagar, which is where the first hosp hospital was established. The John Bishop Memorial Hospital was first run, run by Dr Fanny Butler, a Scottish doctor who Bird met when she was in Kashmir. It's still in operation today, and a recent article praises the work of the doctors in improving health of women and locals in this area, as well as tourists. So it's quite a, a lasting legacy. But then Canada began a new type of, a new period of travel um, for Isabella and the 1890s, um, she marks, it, it, she begins to embark on a new stage of writing and travelling. Her books are no longer travel guides written in a personal format, but become the source of factual and geographical information. Her trip to Persia and Kurdistan was a very dangerous one. That's the, that this very faint picture here is a, one of the maps of her roots, which appears in, in uh, the John Murray collection. She was accompanied here by the British Army and escorted by uh, Major Sawyer, though he is anonymous in the book um, for military intelligence reasons, I believe. And she was assigned her own Kurdistan guard who she doesn't trust. He becomes quite a character, but uh, is later found he's a murderer and wanted the police by the police. 
Um, he's eventually taken away, but not before Isabella does a little sketch of him, which appears in, in her book. In this, um, during this travel, there's quite an insight into her views on restrictions of religion and of women in the area in a letter sent to the YWCA in Tobermory, where she states that, that she fears for her life and sleeps with a gun on, by her side. She lectures across the country as a fellow of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, or the RSGS. Um, and this picture of the National Port the Scottish National Portrait Library is here because it later became the headquarters of the RSGCS. Um, her lectures, this next slide is um it, I've said here that our journey is our journey to Persia and Kurdistan is published at this time, but none of the photographs actually appear in the publication. They were instead used for her series of lectures and to illuminate her talks. At this point, she was requested by the Royal Geographic Society to give them a talk on her journey, but it created quite a controversy over female membership. Bird refused to let a man deliver her talk, um, which they were proposing because women could not be members. Um, they refused to do this, and as a result, she gave her talk to the Royal Scottish Geographical Society um, in the London branch instead. This prompted the Royal Geographic Society to make her a fellow shortly afterwards. And the next slide that you see here is um, her recommendation, which is signed by John Murray, um, her publisher, and John Scott Kelty, the Assistant Secretary at the R RGS at the time. Um, and although she then becomes a member, and I think a handful of others do, female membership was closed shortly after her talk and uh, remains closed until 1913. However, um, one of the results of her becoming a member, Kelty introduced her to photography, uh, to the photographer at the RGS, John Thompson, and from him she took uh, lessons in photography. And this improved her skills and really gave her um, quite a love of photography. The next slide mentions uh, uh, this, uh, when she was presented to Queen Victoria as a traveller. I don't have any photos of that, but the, the, this photo that does appear a little earlier, it's um, outside the House of Commons in 1891, where she was invited to, to speak to discuss the question of the Armenian question after she raised this issue um, at a dinner with John Murray and William Gladstone. So she was becoming quite, and not a political figure in her, but she was consulted as a result of her travels. She was also, she's also, this is, um, next slide is uh, just something from a talk she gave, an address to the Gleaners Missionary Society, where she supports this organization, but she does, so as a traveller, and she makes sure that she addresses the audience as a traveller and um, gives them her observations on the missionary work that she's seen in the areas that she's visited. And she does conclude that um, it's a bit of a, not quite a hopeless task, but she feels that it's not as successful as um, some people think it is, given the scale of the people and the poverty across the world is her take. Um, the next slide is another one of these wonderful engravings. And I thought it was worth mentioning here that there's a lot of beautiful illustrations in, in Bird's books, but there's no accreditation to them. The only one that we do know is this one. This is engraving from Among the Tibetans, um, which was uh, published in 1894. But the engravings by, and I might not pronounce this right, and I'm sure people will, here will correct me, it, were engraved by um, Edward Wimper, or Wimper, who was a mountaineer who climbed the Matterhorn. Um, and I think he also had connections with Canada, I believe. Um, I, yeah, so 
moving on from there, this is when she began her Far Eastern trip, which was one of the earliest photographic records of Korea, Japan and China. And you see here her starting point and some lovely pictures of the Temple of the God of Literature, which I thought was lovely, in Mukden in China, the Altar of the Spirits of the Land in Korea, and uh, the Sampan or Houseboat that she began her trip down the Yangtze River in. So she's really, really developing her skills as a photographer as well as her confidence as a traveller and a, writing, a writer at this time. This is a bit of a dangerous period from her. Um, these are some photographs from um, her, her trip in the 1890s. The first one is in, in Japan the Avenue of Trees in Japan. The Korean passport becomes vital to her as she travels that country, um, as it's on the brink of war. And the photo that she has here of um, China is of, uh, in China is of con the Confucius stone, and lastly a Japanese temple. Just a selection of some of the buildings that she took photographs of. But it was a very dangerous time. It was on the um, cusp of the Sino-Japanese War. And when she arrived in the port of Chempalu, she it was bursting with Japanese war materials, troops and uh, horses. And though the war wasn't officially declared, um, it was really underway when she arrived. As a result, the British Vice Council made her leave with clothes on her back, basically, and sent her to Chifu on the China coast, where she was welcomed by the British Council, who gave her provisions uh, for further travel there. So she continued to travel through the area at this time. She left Chif Chifu for Mukden and um at that point when she was there, the Sino-Japanese War was officially declared. But uh, though she was ill, very ill with fever at the time, she took many photographs of Chinese troops at the time who she describes as um, looking like the losers they probably would be. So which was quite a, it's a, a typical kind of Isabella Bird com uh, comment. So she then left for Vladivostok, visited Korean settlements there and... Um, by the end of the war, she travelled to China for the summer and lectured in Hong Kong on her trips, on her travels. So she then left China after a brief day in Japan to recoup her health. Her rheumatism and sciatica were really kicking in at this time, and she did return to Seoul at this time in the 1895. Um, Sorry. Yeah, and then oh yes, and at this time, the, by this time in 1896, the Korean king, who was a puppet king, the the queen had been assassinated. He had fled to to Russia, and there is a photo of her with the king in the National Library at this time when she had her final audience with him. After that, she left for Shanghai. Uh, and in January 1986, she headed out to the Yangtze River. The Yangtze Valley at this time was not fully sponsored, uh, explored, sorry, by Europeans, but uh, within two years it became a British sphere of influence, which was a term that Isabella actually disapproved of. She concentrated her time on taking photographs and recording life as it was in the time. Um, her photographs show really interesting subject matter, landscape, nature, cultural buildings and monuments, but also a series of photos of people, study of villages, transport, jobs, dress, peasants' way of life, opium pipes, geographical. It, it was really a geographical expedition, but um, it was a quite stunning record of um, the Far East in a period of change. This picture here is um, a, a photograph of one of her letters to John Murray from Korea in 1897, where she says, I must confess that nothing ever took such hold of me as photography has done. If I felt free to follow my inclination, I should give my whole life to it, my whole time to it. And then again, the next picture is a picture of the Great Gate and the Palace of um, 
so in Korea. So these trips resulted in further books being published, The Yangtze Valley and Beyond, and uh, Chinese Pictures. Both had um, photographs in them, a collection of her photographs in them. This photo um, shows, the first photo shows um, the covers from early editions again of the books by John Murray, which are held at the National Library. I think it's really nice to see um, that in the latter, the Chinese, the Chinese picture, this is actually the first time that she signs herself as Mrs. John Bishop. Um, and she allows herself uh, the initials to be a member, a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society. So although the RGS at this time was closed membership to females, uh, those that are already members are allowed to remain so. The Yangtze Valley um, showed images which were never seen before of river settlements, people's bridges and missionaries' homes and the Chinese lifestyles. Um, and at the, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, I think at the Pinyang Fu mission, she left finances to set up a small Henrietta Berg Memorial Hospital. The visit was, out, was not without its dangers, and after leaving the seclusion of the river and the countryside, Isabella was attacked, beaten and almost burnt to death with cries of foreign devil, child eater and kill her following her. She was rescued by the local Mandarin soldiers and accompanied overland as far as Somo, capital of Mansi. This is when she famously sailed down the river, developing her photos in the water, sometimes losing negatives as well as notes in the process. Chinese Pictures is a very small volume consisting of journal notes to accompany her photography. And as I said, as I said it was the first book published and by Murray under the name of Mrs. John Bishop. When, um, when, when Isabella wrote to John Murray saying she was getting married to John Bishop, she did say to him that she would keep her maiden name. So that's, that's why I'm making that point. But John Murray had actually died. Uh, earlier by the time this book was published. John Murray III, that is. Sorry. So this is coming up to the end, um, her, uh, uh, the end of the presentation and the end for Isabella. Uh, her trip to Morocco was one of the last of her trips abroad, but again, a stunning range of photographs was taken by her and um, held in the collection at the National Library of Scotland. And again, it's everyday photos of people, men and women, and their daily activities and dress, which is quite unusual for the time. Unfortunately, she became ill when she returned home. Um, I've not dwelt too much on her recurring illnesses, but she did suffer from ill health throughout her life and uh, bouts of lethargy and depression when she was at home. So she, after a short stay at a nursing home in Edinburgh, she returned home to Melville Street where um, she died. Isabella's gravestone, uh, she was, sorry, she's buried in um, the Dean Cemetery. As you see here, the picture over here with the rest of her family, the whole family are buried there. And what I think is quite uh, interesting is that her gravestone is visited annually and cared for by Professor Kiyonoda Kanasaka of the a Japanese geographer and a professor of, from the University of Tokyo, who was her biography and herself pronounced twin time traveler. He wrote a lot about Bird. Lastly, this last slide um, is the Tobermory clock, which was officially opened in October 1905 in memory of Henrietta. It's based on a clock, down in How How a clock tower in Houghton in Cambridgeshire and was designed by the English architect and illustrator um, Charles Wimper, who was the brother of Edward, who illustrated her books. And it turns out that both the brothers were, they were um, sons of a, a wood engraver, and both of them illustrated birds' books, but I'm not sure who did what, as I said, because that's not documented. Um, 
Whimper's own book, Among the Tibet, uh, was published by John John Murray after Among the Tibetans. Um, it's a book on the Andes Mountains and published in 1892. I think what's, and again, I'll be interested to know if anybody knows more about this, and I'm probably pronouncing the name wrong, but uh, do correct me. But what I think is interesting about uh, Wimper is that he climbed the uh, Canadian Rockies um, in 1901, and he was consulted by the Canadian Pacific Railway Company on tourist routes through the Rockies. So they, they, the family knew them from their time in Huntingdonshire, which is also Houghton. Um, his brother was also an explorer, and I think I think both brothers have got mountains named after them in British Columbia. So if anybody knows more about that detail, so the Tobin Woody Clock Tower is uh, a landmark um, in the town of uh, in the harbour and town of Tobin Woody, and is a listed building listed by Historic Environment Scotland. So <laughs> a bit full circle there. So this is just, um, I've just put this not so much as a bibliography, but just really to, as an example of the legacy of Bird and how people are continually fascinated by her writing, her travels and her life. So it starts off with um, Anna Stordart's bibliography in 1906, which was written just after she died. And it goes all the way through until 2022 when um, Ruby Wax and some of her friends travelled through the Rockies in Isabella's footsteps. So she's obviously still of great interest to people, which is part of my problem, because it's trying to write about her a bit differently. Um, so I'm trying to do that, really, through taking a more subjective approach and thinking about how Isabella's re reading about her, reading her letters, visiting places she's been or ha is associated with, is impacting on my life. So it's a, a more subjective approach to carrying out research on her life. And that's it. <laughs> um, that's maybe taking a bit longer than I thought it would, so apologies for that. Um, I hope you found it interesting. Well, that was indeed uh, interesting, uh, Loretta. And uh, <clears throat> We will be taking questions, so if anybody has a question, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. I have a, a, a general question, uh, uh, Loretta. I mean, how unique was she as a, as a traveler, a female traveler? Was there anybody else in existence close to what she was getting up to? I think there were a lot of people, there were a lot of female travellers around at the time, but they were usually accompanied by husbands or other, uh, or maybe sometimes fathers. Um, I think what was unique about Isabella, I mean, it's often said that she was a solo traveller, which of course she wasn't, which is why I put so much detail into the kind of support that she got as she travelled. But there's no doubt about it that she was unique and that she did travel as a, as a solo female traveller and um, I think that made, made a difference as to how a lot of people reacted to her on her journey, both mm -hmm. good and bad, both good and bad. But there are, I mean, when she went to Japan, uh, Constance, uh, what's his name? Constance Gordon Cummings was there as well. So there were people who, there were other writers and female travellers of the time. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's. Oh, here's a similar question from Mary Jarrett. She's asking, did she travel alone or with servants? Oh, she always had servants. Yeah, she always had people carrying. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think our vision of traveling alone and Isabella's vision of traveling alone <laughs> were, yeah. were quite quite different. So she always, all, obviously, she always had people accompanying her in that sense. Um, and uh, but I mean, in her early biography, Anna Stordart does say that um, she did have a way with people and managed to really kind of get the best out of them. But her books don't always bear that out. <laughs> I would say. Yeah. We just uh, got a comment from Kate. She says, uh, "What a fascinating woman! Thank you for so comprehensively introducing her to us." 
And uh, I think a lot of people will echo that sentiment. Now, uh, Loretta, I, I haven't actually read any of her books, but it seems to me that I heard something about her probably on the BBC some time ago. And I got the impression that some of the conditions that she stayed under were pretty horrible, with flies and mosquitoes and bugs and even rats. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, well, that's absolutely when I, I mean, I know this was just a very fleeting where she went and what she did, um, and not so much about the content, but um, that's why I did say that uh, her trip to Japan, which really began her fascination with the East, it, she she's not that happy in it a lot of the time. I mean, she is in Huffle, she is, you know, in sleeping with the, uh, the animals, you know, she's um, covered in, floors covered in insects and yeah, just not very pleasant living conditions at all. But I think that's where we've got to kind of take her hat off to her. I mean, she's a bit of an enigma to me, you know, there's all sorts of her attitudes to people. She does have this missionary background, or not missionary background, but a religious background and um, uh, seems to want to improve things, but she does have quite um, fixed attitudes towards people and how they live. And uh, that's the enigma, I think. But um, she does put up with it. That That's the thing. She does put up with all the difficulties of travel and then continues to do it. So, yeah, she's, it's really interesting, I think, from that point of view. I mean, some, but I think some of the ways she describes things, once she reads more and more of her books, she tends to give the same kind of descriptions of where she's staying. And even if you go back to how she described the crofters' lives um, when she was visiting the outer and, uh, Hebrides, it's not that much different. It's not that much different how she describes the slums of Edinburgh to how she describes the bubbles in a Japanese mountain village. But she's also fascinated by people's, I think genuinely fascinated by people and how they live. Very good. Okay, some more questions coming in uh, from Anne B. She says, fascinating. How did uh, you first hear of Isabella and develop your interest in her? Well, I'm going to blame that on one of my supervisors. It's not Graham. I don't know if Graham's uh, attending just now, but um, I did um, Emlet. Actually, after I retired, I did a master's in creative writing. Um, and through that, I became interested in archival work again because I'd previously worked in archives long, long ago. And um, I spoke to my, who was then someone who was then my tutor, Gail, and uh, I asked her if there were any interesting 19th century women worth investigating. And she was very excited because I think um, the John Murray archive was just being kind of publicised at that time. And uh, I've never looked back. I, I, I could be there forever, though. There's so much. So much, yeah. Okay, but that's great. what started it. That's what started it, actually, reading, uh, going, going into the archives. Okay, another question, this time from Margaret La Victoire. I hope I've pronounced that. Are her books available in reprints? Yes. Yes, they are. Yeah, you can get lots of them on Amazon and... Um, I shouldn't say that, should I? but yeah, they are. They're available online. Um, I think Virgo did quite a few. Yeah, but they're they're not hard to get. The only thing I would say about the reprints, um, and I, I didn't realise this because I did start, I mean, I'm saying I started in archives, but obviously I read a lot of background information or biographies and then started reading their books too. And they don't have the same illustrations mm -hmm. in them. Um, so that's what's so I think so lovely about going to the going and seeing the originals. But they are available, yes. Okay, the next question is from Janice, and Janice says, Did she keep her strong Christian uh beliefs throughout her life? I would say she did, yes, absolutely. Um I, I kind of wondered about that as I first started reading through not so much her letters, but her books. Um, and she did come into contact with other religions. And again, I'm going back to the Japan, uh, the unbeaten tracks in Japan, because she does look into religion, but she's 
absolutely staunch in our Christ Christianity. And and I think the reason I suppose the reason I, I kind of put this into the presentation is because I, you can see from her upbringing how she, although she ended up traveling to the Far East, she, she, she was looking at missionary work there, but I don't think she wanted to be a missionary. Um, you know, so she, I think I think her real love was traveling and um, partly she was able to go to these countries because of the connections. But yeah, I, I would say now that I've researched a lot further, she's she doesn't waver at all from her Christian beliefs. OK, that's interesting. Another question just reading the chat here from William. He says, I wonder if the new Emily Blunt series uh, the English about the West was in, inspired in part by uh, by Bird's Travel. Are you familiar with that series? I'm not familiar with that, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, I think that there's, yeah, I think, I suppose it's one of these things that I hadn't, really, I hadn't, I confess, heard, I hadn't heard of Isabella Bird before I started my research. And it's one of these things that once you start dipping into, you kind of start seeing it everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And you find out, you know, that lots of people have written about her, um, but she is still, I think, such an inspiration. I've got uh, this last slide that's up here, this NLS exhibition, that's not Isabella climbing, um, climbing the mountain there, but she appeared in that exhibition, um, The Petticoats and Pinnacles, uh, Scotland's Pioneer in Mountain Women. So that was only in 22. I think it was supposed to be early, but it was put back because of COVID. But that, is that kind of goes back to your first question, David, about um, women who, who were around at the time. And there were a lot of them out there exploring, you know, and just bucking the norm in a lot of ways. And I think exhibitions like this highlight women like that. I think there's just this whole look, re-looking now at women's role in um, in history and and in exploration in various areas, so I think that program will will be part of that that movement. I think, which is very welcome. I mm -hmm. think very welcome to see just what what these women achieved. I think this question is also from William, and he says, "Could you expand upon the Saskatchewan connection you mentioned earlier in your presentation?" Well, I was hoping somebody here could, because that's actually something that um, I've only recently um, started, well, I've only recently started to find out a bit more, and it's not its not written anywhere in any of the um, Isabella Bird's materials. You can't find anything really about that, but it was late looking into Lady Gordon Cathcart, it was looking into her history, and that family says you were notorious. You, you, I mean, they are notorious for um their, their their treatment and they were involved in the clearances so, so that's i would like to find out a lot more more about that but because um i looked at her i found out that the that the crofters um the people from the outer hebrides from that time that were part of the assisted immigration uh, scheme it was saskatchewan they were sent to and i think in one of the other articles i read that that's where um yeah, a, a lot, a lot of them were unsuccessful there, you know. But I don't know whether that might be why it's quite a, a blank period, because I know that Isabella did go back to to see. It says, I think it's daughter that says it that she went back to see how the immigration uh, schemes had gone. But we don't hear. We just know she went back. So I would love to find out more about that connection, because I think it's that again. It's that Scottish Canadian connection that. You know, lo and behold, he that is again, you know, and mm -hmm. um, I don't know if William knows any more about that. Well, one of the things I should do at this point is uh, during a, the sign up period when people were registering from the talk, we heard from uh, Isabella Burr's great, great, great oh. aunt who's in Canada. Oh, her name is, remember, and her, her name is Harmony, and I'm wondering, Harmony, are you? Did you did you join this uh, this session? Were you able to join? Okay, it doesn't look like it. Oh, but that is a bit of a pity, uh, because that would have been quite interesting. But apparently, uh, Isabella's great 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 aunt 
lives in Canada and uh, she was one of the people that wanted to join us uh, so I don't know what happened maybe maybe something else cropped up for her it would be but, absolutely lovely to, to to hear a bit about that I mean that's just so exciting I think when you yeah. said that you know that's incredible um, and she might oh. know much more than okay we've got a, a, a prompt here from Anne B uh, Anne can you come in let me just go and see what the Okay, I'll tell you what. Hello. Yeah, is that Anne? Yes, it's Anne. Hi, I live in Toronto and my friend yeah. Harmony lives in Edinburgh. All right. And Harmony had already told me about her great, great aunt. Um, well, I was delighted when this Zoom presentation, when the notice about this Zoom presentation came on my email. Uh, and I told Harmony about this, but uh, she's not in Edinburgh today. And she's not, but she's had difficulty connecting. So, um, okay. So she's not in Canada. She's in Edinburgh. No, she lives in Edinburgh, where I did my degree, and that's how that's my connection. So, um, oh. I think she'd love to speak to you, Loretta. Oh, so I'd I'm, love to speak to her. Not, yeah. she, she was supposed to be on her phone from away and hasn't been able to connect, which is why I'm hoping I can um, get the recording and send it to her. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Now, uh, Loretta, I did send you uh, uh, Harmony's email address, so you can, and maybe Anne, you can facili facilitate a dialogue between Loretta and and uh, Harmony. That would I, be I would love to do that. How can Loretta? How can I connect with you? Well, if I see, David, you've got my um, yeah. What I'll do is. I don't I think you gave me harmonies. I think you told me she was coming, but I don't think you gave me them. Uh, I'm, if, I, if I didn't, I meant to. But I, I, what I will do is I will put the three of you in touch with each other and by Excellent. sending you each other's email. How about that? Ex Excellent. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. And it's been How a about? fascinating presentation. I, I've just um, loved hearing more about this amazing woman. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Yeah, she was amazing. Certainly was amazing. Now, let me just see what we've got here in the way of chats, questions. Uh, if you don't mind, we can go for a little bit longer. Uh, was she interested in women's rights more broadly, for example, votes for women? And this is from Kate McCrone. A very good question, Kate. And I think the short answer to that is no. <laughs> Um, but I did start to look at it. Look at it. You, you actually find that quite a lot of the women who travelled or who were pioneers, explorers, um, were not very supportive of um, the suffragette movement, for example. I read somewhere, it might have been in the Pat Barr biography that you see there in the second uh, picture, um, that although she was, she was absolutely vociferous about the, uh, uh, the RGS, she was, I mean, she absolutely refused to have anything to do with them, do they, until that got sorted out. And um, she is accredited for being um, the person who said that in, in movement. But at the same time, I, there, there's no evidence that I can see anywhere of her, of her involvement with uh, women's movements or support. What I, I, I did read um, was that and actually you see it in a lot of Isabella's writing that she's in some ways she can be quite scathing of twittery wittery women as she describes them you know and um, I think she sees herself as quite a different kettle of fish really you know so in some ways I think she isn't quite sure if they really do deserve um, the vote or more rights it's a hard one but I, I haven't found any evidence to suggest that she was involved in any anything like that. I'm sorry to say. But I don't think it was unusual. That's my point. I don't think it was unusual. I think a lot of these people, women who were doing their own thing, were doing their own thing. That's very interesting. Okay, now here's a question from Mary Jowett. Is there one book that stands out if I were to choose one of her books? <laughs> oh... Um, my immediate my immediate reaction to that was um, unbeaten charts in Japan. But having said that, the Rocky Mountains is uh, 
Do you know the rocket? <laughs> um, the Rocky Mountains is a good one as well. It's it's really because I think what's nice about these earlier pieces is that you get a flavour of her as a woman and her reactions to landscapes. Um, so I would if if you were starting off with it, I would go with some of the some of the earlier works. The Rocky Mountains is maybe a bit of a happier one. The Sandwich Islands is good as well, but I think the Rocky Mountains, she comes into her own mode as a writer and as a personality. Um, so if you're familiar with that area, that might be a good one. But I right. love her beaten tracks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here's another question from Kate McGrown, her comment rather. She says the Cathcart settlers went from Benbecula to Saskatchewan in the 1880s. Many of them stayed and succeeded as farmers, etc., despite the harsh climate, etc. Oh, David, could you just send me that? <laughs> That's okay, so interesting. That's so in and is that what they were called? The what did you say? The Cathcart settlers. Cathcart, Cathcart settlers, and we know ah. Cathcart, don't we? Cathcart's a place in Glasgow. Yes, we do indeed. <laughs> we do indeed. So. Yeah. Can so, Kate McCrone, could you write that down now, Loretta? I was just say, Kate McCrone, I'll, I'll give you Kate McCrone's email address. Thank you so much, Kate. Right. Okay, let me just see what else we've got here. That's actually lovely to you. Oh, okay, here's Jackie to everyone. My sister-in-law is a bird and is from Saskatchewan. <gasps> I could ask her if her family has any connection however remote it can be. So this is Jackie. Fabulous. That, Thank you, Jackie. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. And I think this is this is what, what tends to happen, I think, in right. research generally. You know, it's, it's great because everybody's that's, got that's, different knowledge. That's right, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's just see, William again is saying, Thank you for your presentation. I think that's come to the end of the chat. Okay, uh, right. So, Kate, I think we've come to the end of the Q&A. Uh, I hope I haven't missed anything. Like, let me just run through this chat again. If I've missed anything, my apologies, but I think I've got all of the questions that, that came in. Uh, well, okay, well, thank you very much, Loretta. I'm sorry we couldn't see you. Okay, no, so am I. about that. Yeah, that's, uh, anyway. Uh, we managed to work around it. So thank you uh, very much for, for devoting your time to this. And thanks to each and every one of you who joined us today on Zoom. Uh, and I really appreciate it. It's nice to have your company. So from me, up in the Highlands of Scotland, and Janet, from you, where are you in Fife? I am in Marmot in Fife, yes. Uh -huh. Fife, and to each and every one of you, wherever you may be, Thank you and have a have a great day. Thank you very much, David. Okay, Thank you for inviting me. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.